ارزی بار ارزی بار تو ده پرس و شدو مچ مور و شدو ریز مچ مور You can't imagine in a few short years how many of our beautiful, friendly priests, saintly priests, that just was called to heaven. See? Quite a few years ago, two men had a dream. One a priest and one a layman. We were all very young because it was, oh gosh, in the 50s. It was a wonderful time, lots of graces in it. We just loved those gill meetings. They, they started us off. He was praying to God and he said, God, you're not taking her yet. She's not ready to go. She has too many children. And he spoke right up. <laughs> and and, and he, God listened, you know. <laughs> he taught me the meaning of prayer. More than anything, he taught me the meaning of uh, the enjoyment of the rosary. When he said Mass and he raised the, uh, the cup up, the altar boys looked up at Father Aloysius because the tears were running down their face. She said, when Father blessed me, it felt like God was right there in the room. Uh, this in itself is quite a statement from a six-year-old. But the mother of the little girl next door, whose hips apparently were cured, said, and I felt the same thing. As soon as Father Aloysius laid his hands on my head, uh, I knew that I was in the presence of a person who had to be a saint. Uh, the presence and the power of God uh, were uh, unmistakable. I remember one time after having been blessed by him, having seen him, um, I went outside to the car to go back to the monastery where I lived. And all of a sudden, I noticed a strong aroma of flowers. And it just, it, it struck me. And I looked around to see whether anything was in bloom, any flowers were around, and there was nothing. I'm so happy you came, Father. And I know you're a good priest, Father. And I know you've had problems in your life. And I know that this has happened, and that has happened, and this has happened. And this priest told me I was dumbfounded. I just felt limp. I didn't know what to say. He was practically telling me my past life. He was a real expert in affirmation. And in a real way, sincere way. He wasn't saying he's got to say this three times, he likes you. He just, you knew, he, he was affirming you, you know what I mean? How many people he affirmed that are priests today who probably needed that affirmation, who only knows? I know how he affirmed my vocation, especially when I got later on, going to the missions of Africa and all those things, you know, he was always affirming. This his tremendous holiness, his uh, complete uh, humility that he had. And uh, there was something just magnetic about him that drew us. And that hall, you know how big that hall was, you know, it was full, just completely full. My husband and I at the time had parked our car, gotten out of the car, and started in towards the hospital. And before we had, before we, do I take her, before we crossed the street, I happened to look up. We were on this side of the street, and I happened to look up, and out from out from the hospital door came Father Aloysius. It was Father Aloysius. I don't know if I told you or who I told. Oh, Father Aloysius was here, and he said, "Don't be ridiculous. Father's been dead," and I didn't know he yeah, died. See, I, oh, she didn't know. I she had didn't no idea know that, that he died. Father, uh, was when, when eighty-one. He came out of the doorway. I looked at him. And I said what I said out loud to my husband, and I, and I remember just seeing his face with just a slight smile. And I kept walking, and then I remember turning to look, and I, he wasn't anywhere around him. And I didn't think anything of it until later, 
when people questioned me because of where I said he was already dead and I didn't know, then they wanted to know where he went and I didn't know that either. He just felt such peace and warmth and you would see Father during Mass and he would be holding the Eucharist and he was just, oh, it was just like he was just so in love. And, and you would see this power just coming from him. To witness him saying Mass yeah. is a, a wonderful privilege. Yes. And to, I mean, when he held, held the Eucharist, I mean, it was... <clears throat> It was just something beautiful to see. For Father Aloysius, the angels, his own guardian angel, and the angels, that angelic world was so real that he, it was almost like he could see the angels. And there was Father Aloysius among all these maybe 100, 100 priests. And you could see him because his face was his face was lit up. People say, "Do you mean a light, light like a like a, a a light bulb?" Of course not. There's something else there. There was sanctity in him, sanctity that could look right through you, and sanctity that pulled the best out of you, even when you were rotten. I was like in a daze because I was in this, um, going through this spiritual suffering and I didn't know anything about dark nights. It was like Father Out of Wish knew exactly what was going on in my soul. And he was saying things like, oh, I see in your soul that you have a mistaken idea about Christ. You believe that Christ is only a human body attached to God. He had a human soul too and you don't know that. And I was amazed. I said, no, I don't know that. So I realized Father could see how much you knew about God and didn't know about God, even though you weren't even thinking about it at the moment. Our founder was a businessman, and he gives up everything. Well, I give up everything, but I still think I want to become a millionaire. <laughs> but, but not that way. Now it's a millionaire the other way. What can I do for people? And this is, this is Clarice. We have great hospitality. Then he would refer to himself as a spaceship. He wanted to be like a spiritual spaceship to go all around the world and spread uh, the devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the devotion to the Most Blessed Sacrament. For me, he was a saint, a living saint, and it's not an exaggeration, and uh, I know it's the church authority that decides these things in the long run after they studied somebody's life, but they welcome testimonies about people who knew him personally, and I felt I'd known him really well, being his first personal secretary, and then of course after me being the first personal secretary came Father Charles Carpenter as the next personal secretary, then after that came Father Kevin Mannion as the next personal secretary. Father Albuquerque is a, is a great stimulus, a great encouragement. I know that he's working for us from heaven, but his example for me, and I think it's the same for all of those who know him in the order, the, the, the four years that I lived under the same roof with him, two years in Los Angeles and two years in Fatima, Portugal as his personal secretary, those were the most important years of my education as a priest. Father Aloysius was born in 1905, the feast day of St. Aloysius Gonzaga, June 21st, in Ure, Spain. Uh, the area that Father Aloysius came from, the Basque area, highly Catholic in every sense of the word. Uh, certainly uh, the main route going to Santiago de Compostela, which is a, a major place of pilgrimage, uh, for probably the last uh, you know, 800 uh, years or so, uh, had as one of the routes on the pilgrim's uh, trek was the northern route that went through San Sebastian and went even through Bilbao and uh, went uh, into the northern areas of Spain to Santiago de Compostela. It was a place of pilgrimage and religious fervor of which Father Aloysius and his family knew much about and participated with, especially 
when they went on at least a yearly pilgrimage about 30 miles away to Our Lady of Begonia, which is this beautiful shrine of the Blessed Mother. Here we are at the Basilica of Our Lady of Begonia, who for the Basque people was their patroness. She actually is the patron of the province of Vizcaya. The Marian influence of Our Lady of Begonia uh, for Father Aloysius uh, was quite prominent. I remember in the articles that he had, even in the last years of his life, he had a shrine or a small replica of Our Lady of Begonia uh, on his desk and he was most devoted to her. Father Aloysius was baptized the day after his uh, birth on June 22nd, which that particular year in 1905 was the Feast of Corpus Christi for him to have been baptized on the Feast of Corpus Christi was a special grace and a signal grace, we might call it. Certain family member present said, this baby is destined to be a priest, or there was in the form of a prophecy because of seeing how beautiful it was, the birth on the 21st and the very next day, within 24 hours, he was baptized into the faith. There are over 146 beatified and canonized saints from the Basque country. And to have 146 beatified or canonized coming from a small geographical uh, location is phenomenal. Now for a Basque, the most important identity for the Basques is their language and the house of their father. Mi padre mm -hmm. vivió aquí y mi madre vivió mm -hmm. aquí, pero no tenían dinero para hacer una casa nueva, ah, sí, nunca, sí. nunca. Mm -hmm. No hubieran tenido nunca, mm -hmm. porque no, 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 tres o cuatro vacas, no, ¿qué no, dinero sí. te iba a dar? Sí, 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 nada, nada, nada. Cuando tuve 18 años, dije que aquí no había vida, que había que salir a algún sitio. Mi padre vivió aquí, pero malamente, mm -hmm. malamente. Mi padre quería hacer una casa siempre, pero no tenía dinero. Uh -huh. ¿Y uh, de dónde vienen los otros elecurías? No aquí en Yorey, pero en otros uh, sitios. Elecurías eh, hay, eh, pues eso, en, eh, aquí en Yorey no hay más elecurías. Memorias que tiene de Parry Aloysius, o a lo mejor... Eh, ya, padre Aloysius... Cuando venía a Bilbao, le decía a un primo mío que murió ya, Pachito, Pachi, Bilbao y de Acuría. Pachi vivía en Bilbao y cuando llegaba a Bilbao él decía, oye, 
Pachi, vamos a Oruga. ¿A Oruga cómo vamos? Sí, 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 sí. A mí llevarme a Oruga. ¿Qué quieres hacer? Pues eh, yo tengo que estar con el sobrino mío. No puedo hablar. No puedo hablar porque no. The house is located within um, maybe five minutes walking distance uh, of the ermita dedicated to St. Cristobal, St. Christopher, and Santa Lucy, St. Lucy. Uh, and it's the oldest of the ermitas that is around uh, Ugore today. Now the Claritians uh, made a vocation uh, campaign in the area. So when Father entered the Claritian missionaries, of course, he learned how to speak Spanish, and he learned other languages. In fact, he became uh, a linguist of sorts. It may seem unusual for us today that Aloysius entered the seminary at age 11. We have no television, we don't have the internet, we don't have means of communication. And for a um, people that are very pious, it seems quite natural that they will start on their mature vocation at an earlier age than today. Today it seems like we delay responsibility of, until much later. He received the formation of a postulant. After several years, of course, he became an official novice. When he takes the habit and he professed his vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, temporary vows for three years, and then professed his perpetuals. Father Alawisha studied very hard in the seminary. He told us that the, the amount of study that he had to do, he said, I wouldn't doubt that it would be the same as a doctorate today, and I agree with him. Because they had, I have my doctorate in theology, but he had to read and memorize. He had to know by memory all of the Summa Theologica. He had to read all of it and know it by heart. And you could tell by the way he preached. You know, his, this man has on his fingertips the depth of theology and the greatest theology, of course. Your gardens, my dear brothers and sisters, your gardens are beautiful gardens of, of God. He is very pleased with you. And so you are as good gardeners of the garden of God that is your soul through the sanctifying grace and through all the virtues that are growing in this mystical garden of your soul. And in order that our garden be well prepared so to be the delight of Christ, we must, we must do our level best all these days. And any fault that we notice in ourselves, to block it out without any compassion to ourselves. Let us contemplate also how John the Baptist who was sent by God to be the witness to testify to the light, or who believe in his good news, in, his, in the Holy Gospel. I am a voice in the desert, crying out, make it straight the way of the Lord.
Father Aloysius was ordained a priest November 3rd, 1929, here in Burgos, in the Faculty of Theology in the Seminary of St. Jerome's, which is directly behind me. We are a few hundred feet from the Cathedral of Burgos, which is on the route of the pilgrims as they go to Santiago de Compostelo. After Father's years of formation for the designs of Almighty God, he was sent shortly after ordination to the missions in Panama. He has often remarked that if he had remained in Spain, he probably would have been martyred as one of the Spanish martyrs who died during the Spanish Civil War for their faith. Father Aloysius had some classmates that were martyred at that time, and he mentions the Claritians lost at least 51 of their members. He would have been probably included in that group if he had not been sent to the United States. While Father was in Panama, there was a health issue, and they decided to send him in part, recuperation-wise, to the United States. His first assignments in the United States are in California. He is sent as a Greek and a Latin teacher. Most of his life through the 40s and 50s was as a formation director or collaborator within the Claritian missionaries in their seminaries. So he didn't have a parish like a diocesan priest would have. He was religious and he uh, was part of a timetable and he was part of a formation team. At the end of the 50s, early 60s, he is transferred to Phoenix, Arizona and then to San Antonio, Texas. Finally, in 1969, he has returned to Los Angeles, California, where he continues his ministry, specifically with the guilds. One of the interesting assignments that Father had while he was uh, still a young priest was when he was sent to Momen, Illinois. He was a prefect and he worked in formation. Later, he became the superior of the local community and uh, that is when his life uh, as a chaplain uh, became rather interesting when he met this particular famous religious sister called Mother Mary Mediatrix. The gift of Father Aloysius to read souls, to perform miracles, to have Almighty God listen to the prayers of Father for the cure of an individual, it all dates back to this mystery of the Holy Eucharist, which is celebrated on Holy Thursday, which is the first day of the Easter Triduum. He had said Mass, it was a Holy Thursday, and after Mass he came out and was giving thanks. Um, the Thanksgiving, that prayer said they do after Mass. And he was in a chapel and he said there was only a few people in the chapel. There were a few nuns that were there in this order that's called the, the Order of the uh, Holy Heart of Mary is the name of those nuns. They had originally come from France, a small order. And this is where um, Miss Frances Hennessy later became Sister Mediatrix with them. And she was present. The way Father Al wishes explained to me, he said, Frances Hennessy was present and they saw the same thing. He saw the rays of light come out from the tabernacle and touch him. It was, a, it was kind of a surprise to him. And, um, but he felt like he was in heaven and uh, a wonderful grace. And he said the interesting thing about it was that these other people told him afterwards they had seen it too. And uh, it was said at this moment when he received the gift of reading the souls that after the experience of seeing these golden rays, 
that he was able to see the souls of people afterwards and see all that. That was given to him at that moment. Things like this become controversial, whether they're mysticism or apparitions or anything. So Father was very discreet about it. He did not like to talk about things that were not approved of by the church yet. He did not talk in public about what happened with me, Sister Mediatrix, and he only told that to a few people, and we had to ask them in order to find it out. It, otherwise, he would not talk about it. St. Anthony Mary Claret was one of the greatest apostles of the 19th century. In fact, St. Anthony Mary Claret, I remember Father Aloysius saying this many times, St. Anthony Mary Claret was one of the most prolific writers. He wrote over 95 or 96 volumes. If you start with two things that St. Anthony Mary Claret loved, the Eucharist and Mary, you've already got you, you don't really have to go any further. Everything else just jumps from there, just sort of starts growing and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. St. Anthony Mary Claret had a gift of maintaining the sacred species of the body and blood of Christ from communion to communion. Jesus had told him, I shall be inside of you, my presence, my living presence shall be inside of you, the Eucharist, which is Jesus and he would take the Eucharist and it would remain in him. Now, now that's kind of hard to explain. It never left him. We take it, we consume it, it's with us, but what do we do? We spoil it. We spoil it with our sins, with our selfishness, with our lies, with our divisions, all kinds of things. His didn't. The confirmation that Jesus has done the same grace as he did with St. Anthony Mary Claret, but in the life of Father Aloysius, which dates uh, back to the early 40s, is that Father has this gift of miracles. Even when he was speaking to you, it seemed like he was somehow or other communicating with God at that time. I was always in amazement. I was always in amazement. I'd go into his office and I thought I was in Excuse me the expression, but I felt almost I was as if I were in the presence of the, the Blessed Sacrament. I didn't know at the time that he had the two presents, but I found that out later on. He kept it as a, pretty much as a big secret. I can say that he had to have it because he could not have said to me the things he said to me, impossible. And I didn't make them up. And I never asked for him, never said a word. In fact, I wish he was, would have passed me by that day. Even in airports. People would turn around and look at him, you know, what, what, where, is, where is this person coming from? People that were sitting next to him felt, even without knowing who he was, they felt like they were comforted by him. Like as if you were sitting next to a, a bonfire and you're living, you're living in Alaska. I think one of the things that most impressed me about Father the Wishes is he radiated a special presence. It was, you felt this, just a great joy just to be in his presence. And I always felt like I was with this great saint, like a, a Saint Francis of Assisi. He was given gifts, and, and, and you can deny that he had them, but you're foolish if you do. Unless you lived with him and saw him, and you're, it's living proof that God can, can make saints out of people. In the late 40s, actually 1948, Father Aloysius founds his first guild. Now the guild is a prayer group. It comes together with a specific purpose of sharing the devotion of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And at the guild meetings, uh, those present recited 15 decades of the Holy Rosary. He would impose uh, the scapular of Mount Carmel on the guild members the members of the guild would recite the act of perfect filial consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Uh, many times there were miracles of conversion, sometimes there were miracles of actual physical healings. Father Aloysius always remembered to share with the people how important it is to be grateful to Almighty God if they did receive any type of special gift from him, like a healing. And this is his contact with the people. Since he did not at this time, during the 50s, he was not a pastor, so he didn't have the regular contact that normal pastors would have. He was a chaplain. He was the master of novices. He worked internally within the Claritians, so his contact with the outside people was through the guilds.
It was through the guilds that Father Aloysius came in contact with as many as, at that particular time, 6,000 people, probably many more, but there were 6,000 names on the list that Father Aloysius left at his death that considered themselves the spiritual sons and daughters of Father Aloysius. And in 1968, 1970, and 1976, he went on pilgrimage to the Marian sites of Europe and to other Catholic uh, shrines. On the pilgrimage in 1970, Father Aloysius coordinates a celebration of Holy Mass at the exact moment of St. Anthony Mary Claret's passing 100 years earlier. St. Anthony Claret died in 1870, so Father Aloysius in the Cistercian Monastery that he is visiting with pilgrims in France celebrates and consecrates just at the exact moment 100 years after St. Anthony Mary Claret's death. An inspiration comes to Father Aloysius on that pilgrimage to found in thanksgiving to Almighty God for the benefits and graces that Almighty God has given to St. Anthony Mary Claret during his lifetime, a monastic community within the Claretian family in Fatima, because they also are visiting Fatima. And one year later, after he gets the permission from his ecclesiastical superiors, he goes with a group of 10 Americans who want to follow Father Aloysius in this new project of Claritian missionaries of perpetual adoration. Father Aloysius received permission and begins his work of perpetual adoration in Fatima in 1971. The exact date is approximately October 11th, 12th, and 13th. He certainly was a Fatima priest in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Father Aloysius sees a direct parallel between St. Anthony Mary Claret and the themes in his life and the themes in the message of Our Lady of Fatima the Most Blessed Trinity, the Holy Eucharist, have that devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, you have the devotion to the Rosary, the Scapular Mount Carmel, the Sorrowful Heart of Mary. We have the compassion for sinners, and this motivates uh, the children, as well as St. Anthony Mary Claret, uh, to practice mortification and to uh, offer up sacrifices to Almighty God for the conversion of sinners. We have angels in St. Anthony Mary Claret's life. He was actually considered, uh, he says this in his autobiography, uh, the seventh angel of the apocalypse. We have the children of Fatima who are visibly um, protected by the angels and they see the angels. And even in this recent third secret of Fatima, it starts out with an angel holding a sword in the angel's hand about to deliver the wrath of Almighty God, and this is held back by the Immaculate Heart of Mary. We have uh, Saint Joseph, who is patron of the Universal Church, which was uh, declared such in the Vatican Council I, 1870, and you have Saint Joseph appearing in the last apparition on October 13th, 1917. We have uh, the famous prediction by St. Anthony Mary Claret about communism being the scourge that Almighty God will use to purify uh, ungrateful humanity. And so in those particular points, Father Aloysius sees clearly a parallel between his founder, St. Anthony Mary Claret, and uh, the message of Our Lady of Fatima. When the Basilica of Our Lady of Fatima was dedicated in the early 50s, it happened at a time shortly after the canonization of St. Anthony Mary Claret. The designers of the Basilica saw in the life and writings of St. Anthony Mary Claret a forerunner of the Fatima message in the sense that he spread devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary 
and they saw St. Dominic as representative of the devotion to the Most Holy Rosary, and they decided to place these two statues uh, on either side of uh, the main altar. St. Anthony Mary Claret has his place at the right hand of our Blessed Mother, and when Father Aloysius writes his article on St. Anthony Claret as the perfect forerunner of the Fatima message, he uses the word deservedly. You had so many pilgrims going there and praying that Father Aloysius was very moved to uh, start his Claritian missionaries of perpetual adoration on the holy grounds of Fatima. Before Ali appeared in Fatima, there were three apparitions of an angel. And in the third apparition, the angel came with the Holy Eucharist, the host, and a chalice. And the blood dripped down from the chalice into the host, and he gave um, uh, Lucia, Jacinta, and Francisco Holy Communion. And of course, before he did this, he bowed down, prayed the, the prayer of Fatima, O Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore you profoundly. But he did that three times, gave them Holy Communion, and um, then he prostrated himself another three times with his forehead to the ground, and he repeated that prayer another three times. And so he said, this is, for this reason, we're Eucharistic, that our Lord needs reparation in the Most Blessed Sacrament. Then he said, in the, in the second apparition, Our Lady reveals her Immaculate Heart. And she begins to speak that, that God wishes to uh, extend devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And so for this reason, we have this devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The Eucharist first, then the Heart of Mary, as a means of arriving at the Eucharist. That's why our full title is Missionaries of Perpetual Adoration of the Most Blessed Sacrament and Perpetual Veneration of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That's a mouthful. But it says it all. First of all, we're missionaries. And we're missionaries of perpetual adoration. And we're fortunate because the first and principal duty of all religious is to be dedicated to assiduous prayer and the contemplation of divine things. So prayer and contemplation is number one in any religious order. So we have that aspect, perpetual adoration and veneration of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But popularly, people call us the missionaries of Fatima for the simple reason that we were founded in Fatima, Portugal. As far as we know, we were the first religious order of men, or the only religious order of men, to be founded at the shrine of Our Lady of Fatima. We lived there from 1971 to 1973. Okay, that is the level of spirituality, but then you have to talk about charism. Charism is manifested primarily what you do to help build up the church. A charism is always a social grace, a grace that impacts other people to build up the, church, the body of Christ. So Father Aloysius said the charism that it should be distinguished in our congregation is a, love and atten a loving attention for people who are sick and dying. Not in the sense that we're going to be uh, into the medical sciences or anything like that, or working in hospitals as uh, staff, members of the staff, but to be like angels that go to visit the sick and the dying and to try to encourage them. That was what Father Aloysius was doing.
when I first met him, he was an extremely ebullient person. He was always uh, filled with dynamism and excitement and energy. I mean, he was just exuding energy. Anybody that got near him felt like they were, they were receiving something, something like a ch an electric charge of, of energy from God. So when we got into Fatima, all of a sudden, you know, this life of blessing people and then seeing them being totally healed, all of that stopped, except only, I think, one time. There was a man in a town in the, uh, in the seat of the Diocese of Fatima, which was called Leiria. Somebody wanted him to bless a man who had cancer of the throat, and that man was healed. But I think it was the only case in two years. It was kind of like a time of Father Aloysius' life when he was called to kind of like go into a cave and then suffer. I think when we read the lives of the saints, we find very similar things that are very similar. Like for example, many people were surprised that Mother Teresa of Calcutta had a, said so many years of dryness. Well, you can find that in the history of many saints, like you can find it in Saint Jean Francois de Chantal, who was a spiritual daughter of Saint Francis de Sales, many years in total dryness. Saint Alphonse de Ligorio, even after going through the transforming union, he went into a terrible dark night near the end of his life. He was even expelled from his religious order that he himself had founded. You can find this in the lives of many saints. There, there was a lot of suffering in his life. Uh, you know, it, was, it came from everywhere. It wasn't just a, 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 a physical suffering, it was a spiritual suffering, and it was also the humanness the, of unkindness where people can suffer. You can suffer because other people do not know what's happening to you, and nobody can understand you, and so you suffer because of misunderstanding, and that was great suffering. I think that when we suffer, if we have faith, it, someone is always benefiting from it. We are being purified, but if we're already purified, like Father Elvishas, I think he was more than purified, uh, he is benefiting someone else. When Father took his group to Fatima to form the Claritian Missionaries of Perpetual Adoration in the year 1971, he had a time limit, I believe, of about two or three years. Within a year after the foundation, uh, the Father General asks Father to take his group and found uh, an independent congregation while Father maintains his status as a Claritian. And so the name uh, is no longer Claritian Missionaries of Perpetual Adoration, but his original intention is to create a house of prayer within the Claritian order to pray for the sanctification and the mission of the Claritian missionaries, the Sons of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the congregation that is founded by his beloved founder, Saint Anthony Mary Claret. His health finally does not permit him to continue his work. So in 1973, he returns to the States. After our two year stay in Fatima, Portugal, we more or less considered, well, if God wants us to survive, he will show us later on what to do. So we dispersed, we disbanded, and that was a very difficult, uh, it was really a shock, for, especially for Father Aloysius, it was a shock because it looked like we were at the end of our ropes, you know, there's nothing more to do. And we, I flew back with him from Lisbon to Los Angeles on August 1st, 1973. He said rosaries the whole trip. I don't think he slept a wink. He's saying rosary after rosary after rosary because, because that was for him, maybe the, the doors were being shut. But I continued to tell him, it's, you know, if God wants us to be established somewhere else, we will be. In 1977, Father Aloysius was looking for a benevolent bishop, and we found Bishop Miguel Gonzalez of Ciudad Obregón in Mexico, who accepted uh, the congregation, and he allowed uh, us to go ahead and purchase property. That year, we set up on September the 2nd, 1977, the bishop brought the Blessed Sacrament here in a procession from the main church 
And the people that were there, some of them were from the United States, some of them from here, they signed a book kind of like the, the charter of acceptance by the bishop of our being here in this diocese. We found that uh, the location of Alamos was quite historical. In fact, Alamos itself uh, was the principal church over that particular area uh, in Mexico. And at one time, that particular uh, area, including the states of Sonora and um, uh, Sinaloa, were considered what is called the Nueva Vizcaya. Now, Father Aloysius, his Basque province, which is located in Spain, is called Vizcaya. And uh, how interesting the coincidence that Father Aloysius would uh, locate a bishop in the Nueva, at one time, the Nueva Vizcaya. It's a very beautiful place. You can tell here, they say that this town is where the desert and the mountains and the tropics meet. It is a location of a town where Coronado, the famous explorer, the Spanish explorer who was looking for the seven cities of gold, and he had a large party of um, teammates who never did incidentally find the seven cities of gold. The crown of the confessors is the, is the victory over the devil. You see, you have the crown for the virgins, crown for the martyrs, and crown for the confessors. The crown for the virgins is when you speak of the world, the flesh, and the devil, it's the flesh. When it's martyrs, it's the world. It's the victory over the world. And when it's the confessors, it's the victory over the devil, because the devil is trying to do the opposite of what Christ was doing, evangelizing the world, saving souls. He's trying to actually counter-evangelize. So you get a priest like Father Aloysius, who is extending the kingdom of God by, first of all, by his example. You couldn't see him without saying, what is it this person has? Father Aloysius had a very special devotion to the Most Blessed Sacrament, and especially St. John's Gospel, where in chapter, I believe it's chapter 13 through chapter 17, it's the Last Supper discourse, and Father Aloysius takes this scripture of St. John and interiorizes it, and this is when Jesus calls his disciples friends. You are now my friends. And the new commandment of love is love your brother and your sister as I have loved you. Father Aloysius always had a great talent for new vocations. Young men were attracted to him instantly. Just meeting him was, a, it was an emotional experience. Besides being a very holy man, he was in charge of making many, many other people holy and bringing many souls with him to heaven, because of it, first of all, because of his example, and secondly, by what he taught us. He would always fortify the person, wherever they were, whatever walk of life, he was able to build them up and make them feel like they were important in God's eyes and that they should continue to get close to Almighty God, of course, by going to Mass, going to the sacraments, going to, to confession. But he would always support the person right where they were. He was able to be on the same wavelength that they were on, either spiritually or uh, emotionally or psychologically. And that is why I believe he touched so many people. To find a person who was willing to listen to you, but not only listen to you, but could understand. When he looked at you in your eyes, you could, you could tell he's understanding what I, what I want to say. And he could actually fill in the sentences, you mean this and this and this and this happened? And you say, yeah, exactly, that's where I'm at right now. Because he had heard these stories so many times and he had, his, he had special gifts, special lights from God to do that. He had a unique sense of, um, being all things to all people, 
I remember there were non-believers at times who were married to believers, and he, in the presence at the dinner that they invited him to attend, he would make sure that he would meet the non-believer right where they were, at a human level. There was nothing, I would say, uh, affected or artificial about his spirituality. He was quite human. In fact, he was more human than most. So just as he is as extraordinary as a, a miracle worker or as someone that would be considered a wonder worker, he was also human, so human that uh, he actually gives meaning to the word human. I just remember he was kind. And I always will remember his big, fat, white hands, <laughs> you know. He just had beautiful hands, he, you know. And so he would just bless you like this, and he would just, he wouldn't say much. But you felt like he was a vacuum cleaner. Oh, so they were just working inside and, and stirring inside. For me, what really drew my attention most about Father Aloysius was if you could say that anybody loved God, he looked like he was constantly communicating with God. I mean, it looked like he was just what happens to most of us in one moment. Once in a while, we have this moment when we feel like we're just really charged up about God. He looked that way all the time. Of course, it doesn't mean that he never had moments of great suffering. He had moments of great suffering, but you never perceived this as being something that was outside of that, that drama that he was living. He was a very dramatic person. I don't think he, he took that suffering as anything else but a purification, because this is the way he would look at things. It was not because of anything else that was happening. He took it on because of my sins, your sins, the world's sins. He would take his also, the suffering. So you could see that within him. He, you know, he, I never saw him grumble. I never heard him say anything, but he did suffer. And he may have, he may have commented to other people, but I never heard it. I see that Father Aloysius in a special way had a presence at times where you could very clearly see Almighty God had done something and was using Father Aloysius for God's purposes. I had my eyes wide open to see how he was dealing with people, how he was dealing with God, how, did he pray? how was he praying. I had to drive him for him as a chauffeur a lot in Los Angeles. And uh, most of the time, he would, be, he would be praying. Most of the time, either he'd be saying his rosary, or he, he looked like he was speaking to uh, angels or saints. He looked like he was. In fact, when I came back from, uh, one summer, I came back from, from Burgos to see him, I was, and I was driving him around. And I hadn't seen him in such a long time, I wanted to talk. So, you know, I, would, I was interrupting him. I was interrupting him because I wanted to talk. I didn't realize I was interrupting him because sometimes you couldn't tell if he was praying or not. So finally he told me, he says, he says, you want to talk a lot. He says, what about prayer? And <laughs> I said, okay. I said, but it's been such a long time we haven't seen each other.
Well, there's a lady who lives right here. She's a Mexican lady. Her and her aunt, who was a nun, who went with us to, to Los Angeles. This woman is legally blind. When we went to Father Aloysius' Mass, Father Aloysius was still living at the time, we went to his Mass, uh, and he blessed people after the Mass. People would kneel down, he would bless each person one by one. But when he blessed her eyes, he said, close your eyes, and he put his fingers on her, on her uh, eyelids. And he said, now open your eyes. And she said, I could see so clearly. I had never seen like that in years. And so Father said, bring over a little book with the smallest, Andra, the smallest print that you can find in this room. So they brought an old missile that had very, very small print. And she looked at it, she it was like reading letters that were that big. She went to see her doctor. She used to go and see her doctor in Tucson every six months because the, the case was degenerating. He, he looked at the eyes and he says, I'm seeing something that I don't understand. He said, this is incredible. All of the wounds in your eyes that were bleeding wounds are healed. He said, normally they never heal. There's no medical explanation for this. So she said, well, a priest blessed my eyes. And he says, well, no wonder, he says, because there's no other explanation. I, I know some things that I saw, that I smelled, that I heard. And so that was enough for me. But I remember in some of his masses, all of a sudden he would get, he would start shaking and stop. And I thought one day, I'm gonna be the last one so I can get his last blessing. So I was walking up there and the guy before me got the blessing, all of a sudden he starts getting, you know, and I said to myself, oh my God, it must be my sins. That's what I thought. But it wasn't. He was going into whatever stage he was going into in his, his spiritual growth. And you can't make those things up. You cannot make those things up. And I didn't get my blessing, by the way, anyway. <laughs> so I, but I, but he was my confessor. He knew my sins anyway. And um, I was scared sometimes of him because of that. Because if I were in sin, he knew it. And he would say something and said, oh, God. But, but that was a gift. And that was a gift for me, too, to be better around him, to strive to become holy. When people would come and ask for a blessing because they had cancer or something like that, after a while, it became, at first it was a big surprise. You know, People would say, they'd call up the next day and say, I'm totally healed. You know? That would surprise me. But after a while, after those two years, uh, when I read something about miracles or heard people doubting that a miracle could, I thought, no problem. Miracles happen. I mean, they just happen. You know, if you have the faith, you don't have to think about whether or not a miracle is possible. It's just, of course it's possible. When you see it with your own eyes, uh, you, you, you don't have any doubt about it again. And it was the most unusual thing I had ever seen because I had never seen anyone do a healing. And he would bless each ear. And then he would have another person um, cover the ears. In a very low voice, he would say, can you hear me? Um, what is your name? What parish are you from, home, from? They couldn't hear a thing. And so he did it again. He blessed the ears. And then he had someone cover, it up, cover up the ears. And in a very low, low voice, um, what is your name? What parish do you come from? and they were able to respond. And then he says, you are, you're healed. Then I remember very well, he turned around like this, he looked at me and he says, do you want to become a priest? Now I was shocked because <laughs> I had really come to the discernment that God was, that I was going to become a priest just months before. So it was just a decision that I had, um, that I felt like God was calling me just a little bit before and for a priest just to, he just turned around and looked straight at me and he says, do you want to become a priest? And then he was all excited. He was a super, um, and he's, he blessed me again. And I just remembered the greatest peace. And I almost felt like it was floating, like I was in heaven. There was a special graces just in giving that blessing on um, follow the wishes. There was a raffle at which door prizes were given out to the winner. Now everyone that came to the benefit dinner received a ticket and it had a number on it. Tony Vorndren picked out a number, read the winning ticket, the number of the ticket. I was sitting back with Father Aloysius and he stands up 
and from the back of the room he says, no, that's not correct. Read the number again. So the Vorndren young lady looked at the ticket and she read now correctly the right number and Father Aloysius said, that's my number and he comes up to the microphone, he's not interested in the door prize, and he says, I asked St. Michael the Archangel to give me this last prize so that I could say something about St. Michael the Archangel. And so he spoke a little bit about St. Michael and the intervention of the angels and how we all have a guardian angel and so forth. And you could see things also far away and even through the thoughts of people coming through the walls because we were in the office in time and I had my desk in one place in the office and it was a very large office and he had his desk in the other part and he would look at the wall where the people would wait on the outside to come in to see him and he would tell me sometimes, he would say, oh, you can stay here and waiting here because this person, there's somebody on this side of the wall, but they're going to come and they're going to give me a donation for a uh, mass type. And so you just stay here. You can even help with that. Uh, and the other times he said, you look, he says, no, you better leave. This person's coming. Um, they have a big problem. And uh, <laughs> you, you, this is uh, a private thing, so you better leave. So I just leave. So it was interesting you could see on the other side of the wall. Whatever happened, I was his personal secretary. I could tell when he answered the phone or when somebody came or we had to go somewhere or who showed up. It seemed like everything was orchestrated. It seemed like everything was happening at, a, at the a precise moment when it had to happen. I thought, how is it possible? It looked like he was completely unaware of it. It looked like he was totally unaware, but I was just with my mouth open. I said, how could that have happened in precisely this moment? At first, you're you could do somersaults. You could say, this is, this is incredible. Everybody ought to know about this. You feel like running through the streets and screaming, but then after a while you say, you say to yourself, he is living a life, a normal life, but at the same time, it's just completely transfused with God. I say, well, why aren't there other people doing it? Or well, maybe there are. So this was all, for me, a tremendous experience. And I repeat, with no exaggeration, it was the most important part of my formation. And if I am a priest today, it's because of that. Well, I was born in 1977, and then in 1979, I was diagnosed with leukemia. I was two and a half. And um, they took me to the Los Angeles Children's Hospital, and I went into coma two days. And my mom had no option, and she was really desperate. And my dad was losing hope. And they heard about Father Aloysius, how he interceded to God through Mary, curing especially children with cancer. So my dad went to the Clarition Center in Los Angeles, and the secretary answered the door, and he says, I'm looking for Father Aloysius. And she said, you know, I, you, you can't see him because he had open heart surgery and he needs to rest. So my dad started sobbing. And he said, well, my, my wife is losing her mind and I'm going to lose it with her because our child is two and a half and she's in coma and she has leukemia. He is our only hope. So um, she let him in and she said only five minutes, five minutes because he's really sick. And Father Lurishes came down the stairs and he told my dad, Fidel, what little faith you have. And my dad was amazed because he didn't know him. And he knew his name, and he started crying. I'm here because my daughter's dying. She's two and a half, and I, I, I'm losing hope in God. And he said, you know, she is sleeping. She's not dying. And he said, well, it's not true. So my dad said, well, give me the blessing, for she could receive it in the hospital. So he gave the blessing, and at the time he finished the blessing, I received it in the hospital, and I got a coma. And at that moment, I was instantly cured through his intercession. There's a man who lives about uh, 60 miles from here. And he was healed of cancer. All, I, all we had to do was just tell him, if you really believe, you can, if God wants to heal you, you've got to keep insisting. 
keep insisting. The doctor had given him about six weeks or something like that to live. He was healed a year ago. And he says today, he says, I can hardly believe that I was ever sick. A few years ago, I was very ill when I was uh, 106 fever and they were, weren't able to break it. But I felt a hand on my head and I knew it was Father Aloysius telling me, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. And I didn't worry. And then it went down, my fever. And again, it was back up the next day, Sunday at noon. I felt the hand again, and it was sort of like, this is it, you'll be all right. And the fever went down, and that was it. You have to believe that you're going to be healed, if that's God's will. But you have to ask for it, and you have to ask for it with perseverance. Like the lady in the Gospel of uh, St. Luke, the one who asked for justice, and the judge was an unjust judge, and he kept, he kept, saying, he kept ignoring her. So she kept bothering him, and pretty soon he gave her everything she wanted because he wanted to get rid of her uh, pesty you know, attitude. So you tell people that, you know, if you ask God long enough, he's either got to give you what you're asking for to show you that you don't need it, or because you, shouldn't have, you should not have received it. It would not have been good for you. Or because as a reward for your perseverance. Father Aloysius continues his work directing the guilds until the end of his life. I believe that the last guild he has is the guild in February or March of 1981. When he died, he died like Jesus on the cross in the center of two other hospital beds whose patients died before him and were taken out. And then he dies about three o'clock in the afternoon, almost abandoned like Jesus on the cross. Father Aloysius, when he died, was buried in the Claritian burial ground of uh, San Gabriel Mission. Well, we had the coffin, but we had to put a plastic cover on it because people wanted to take everything, every relic that they could take. And then after, after the burial, after they had been you know, put down to the ground, they took every flower. There was not one flower left because of relics. Nuns and lay people, and priests, you know, bishops, he was holy. People that esteemed Father and held him as a saint visit his burial place. Some have claimed that they have received special insights and graces um, at his grave. And once a year there is a memorial mass which the Claritians, together with the missionaries in Mexico, celebrate in honor of Father Aloysius and to honor his memory. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. If you compare a, a pane of glass with a person's soul, if the, person, if the pane of glass is transparent or completely purified, it's going to receive more, more of the grace. It's going to go through. But the dirtier it is, the less that, that, that ray, the rays of God's, the sun, the rays of God's grace are not going to penetrate. So God does not have favorites in that sense. God is giving his grace to everyone, 
But are we receiving it? How do we receive Holy Communion? With how much fervor? How much, how much do we give ourselves to Christ when we have him in our breast? Are we really giving ourselves on our entire lives without reserves and saying, do with me whatever you want, dear Jesus. Take me. Overpower my life. Take me. Don't look at me with my resistances. Take me or double me back. You know, Take me and do with me whatever you want to do. And he will. God will do it. He'll take you up on that. 